Rise and Ground. Folks, I'm on the way to a no heat call. Technically, this is like a maintenance call um, that this customer booked yesterday for today, but she said today that um, she actually turned the heat on last night, knowing that we'll come out this morning, and um, the heat didn't turn on. So, technically, this is like a no heat call. If we go there and something's wrong, we'll take a look, but if everything is rocking and rolling, we'll just do the maintenance. And also, my next call is like in the same building, well, actually, it's in the same complex, but a different building. So, I'm going to be here for a little bit for the better part of this morning. But, guys, I'm back around the corner from there right now. I'm going to go take a look, and we'll see what we find. I'll see you all in a little bit. Peace. All right, guys. Let me turn my light on here. We got our thermostat calling. And I'm getting three blinks. Two, three. And three blinks here. Means our pressure switch is stuck open or stuck closed. Now I did not hear my inducer run, which is odd. Let me take one lead off this switch here and turn it off and turn it on. Let's see which one it is. If this switch is stuck open or closed. I know some brands, if the switch is stuck closed before the call for heat, the inducer won't run. And right now, still giving us three blinks with the wire off. So now what we want to do is see if our inducer motor is getting power. There is no safeties on this inducer that will cause it not to work. It looks like all these wires come straight from the board. But let's find, let me get my meter and let's see what's going on. I'll see y'all in a little bit. All right. And tracing the black and red wire. Looks like our hot lead is going there. And our common is going to the other side. Of the contractor. And as you can see, our hot lead to ground. We are getting power. So this induced motor is shot. So I got my power off. And the common, everything was connected. Let me look at this common here. Yeah. Yeah, it's getting power. Looks like the line is probably just shorted out. This thing isn't even hot, which is weird. But yep. All right, let me get the model and serial number, and let's find out who has this and do some motor and stuff. I'll see you guys in a little bit. All right, guys, I just left the supply house. I got my new motor, and I picked up some filters. Hey, yeah, guys. What we do, whenever we have bad inducer motors, we always tend to replace the pressure switch as well because at this point, guys, I mean, assuming this is like a, a residential unit, I mean, most pressure switches are cheap anyway, and since they work in tandem, we would hate to put a brand new inducer motor in and then come back, you know, two or three weeks later to replace a pressure switch. And guys, I don't know, something about the cold weather, uh, I know this happened a lot last year too, but whenever we get like a lot of you know 20 degree nights and 30 degree nights we get a lot of intermittent calls and it turns out to be the pressure switch you know like i mean and we make it a, a point too you know anytime and this is just some uh, some more free game for you guys whenever we have a bunch of intermittent calls on 80 percent gas furnaces of course you got the flame sensors but sometimes those pressure switches can be tricky too because with some manufacturers like for instance duquesne 
customers can pull out the recent fault. Well, you can pull out the recent fault codes even if the unit is still working. But from from the systems I'm talking about in general that had those recent fault codes stored, we always get those pressure switch faults. And then as soon as we go there, the unit is working fine. So, like I said, guys, we always tend to replace pressure switches preventatively. But most importantly, if we're doing inducer motors, it's nothing wrong with just replacing a pressure switch anyway. So, yeah, guys, I'm on the way back there right now i'll be back there in like another 20 minutes i will see y'all when i get back peace guys we are back in the saddle we took our old and do some motor out and i had to run to the supply house and get another one and we actually killed two birds with one stone guys i was able to go to the third floor we got another customer upstairs the exact same unit i was able to do the maintenance up there all while I was on the phone with the supply house when they were trying to get me an exact fit with that inducer motor. So this is actually my last stop for today. So this gives me enough time to just go over a little bit more things with you guys. But guys, what I'm gonna do while I have this old motor out is I'm gonna do the heat maintenance. I'm gonna take my spark rods out and take my flame sensor out and I'm gonna get that cleaned up all while I have the space. And for you guys that work on Magic Pack units, I recommend one tool. You're gonna to need a right angle drill bit. This is the only way you're gonna get your sensors out and your spark rods out, and most importantly, the bottom screw on this inducer motor. You can't get it. As you can see, this hole is below the damn. I don't know why they make it like that, but you can't get this with a nut driver. You gotta get an extension bit with a right angle bit. And this is how you t this is actually how I was able to take the screws, that bottom screw out that out that inducer assembly. But guys, real quick, let me get this set up and let me get this taken apart. And I'm gonna show you. I can tell from here that spark rod definitely looks a little dirty. I'm gonna show you how that looks. Let me take this apart, I'll see y'all in a little bit. All right, guys, and this may not seem like much, but you see that? Let me zoom in. See that oxidation there? Over time, this could cause one or two things to happen. If my spark rods gets covered in that oxidation too much, this spark rod won't light. And two, if this flame sensor gets covered in oxidation, the system will ignite, but the flames won't stay on. So... It's very critical with these particular units that you clean these out, or you take these out and you inspect them. And if they do look anything similar to what I'm showing you here, it's best to just take an emery cloth and clean them. So, I should have my cloth inside of my meter pouch. Let's take this out and let's clean it. I'll see y'all in a little bit. All right, guys. This is the after. And this is good money. And you don't want to get too crazy with cleaning these things. And once again, guys, if I attempted to clean either my spark igniter or my flame sensor and it still looked like what I just showed you guys earlier, at that point, I would recommend replacing it due to the fact that there's no way to clean it. But like I said, guys, it takes a while for this to happen. This particular unit, this customer says about like 15, 16 years old. These things run like tanks as long as, like I said, a customer gets the maintenance done on these units and the smaller parts get, gets taken care of before it turns into a bigger issue. And just to show you, we're out here in May and this filter is still clean, so can't go wrong with that. But yeah, that's with anything, whether it be a heat pump, a bull, or a furnace, there is a there is like an expected lifespan on the equipment, but some units can outlast 12 to 15 years, but no unit is going to outlast 12 to 15 years unless smaller things get taken care of before it snowballs into a bigger effect. And like I said, someone comes out to keep these units clean. All right, so moving along, I don't have to clean the MD support because this is brand new. So what I'm gonna do is, 
I'm going to, and I got another pressure switch as well. I'm going to put that pressure switch in, put the sensors back in, and yeah, lastly, we're just going to slap that diesel motor back on. All right, guys, let me put the sensors in and let's get our new pressure switch mounted on. I'll see you in a little bit. All right, guys. I got my pressure switch out, and this is only a 0 0.10 switch. So, we're just going to put in a universal air switch. And, guys, from my experience, we've been putting in these universal pressure switches at least for a good five or six years now, and no issues, only because we know in what applications these switches will work and in what applications these switches won't work. Now, I can tell you now these work, and this is a new switch by the way, old ones here, I already got the spring in here, but these switches work for about like 98% of applications regarding replacing pressure switches, however, the 0.2% the 0.2%, I believe Carrier has, and I'm talking those 96% three stage furnaces, Carrier has those dual sided switches. You'll know when you see one. It won't look anything like this. It'll basically be like something like this, as a matter of fact. Hold on. It'll look something similar to this. But in that scenario, guys, you'll have to go OEM. And I know most supplier, well, maybe Pierce Phelps out here. And I think there's a carrier supplier as well. But I know most carrier suppliers or dealers have th those pressure switches in stock, but I tried replacing a two-faced pressure switch for one of these and it didn't work out. I think it fired up once and then it did the same thing, but I ended up ripping out the universal and putting in the OEM and that particular one worked. So that was the only time, speaking from my experience, that these universal switches didn't work, but for the most part, if you put the right color spring in for one and two, if you know what size the old switch is, and three, if you check in induce motor for prop into the water column, you can't lose in replacing pressure switches, especially with the universal ones. So, all right, guys, moving on. I think I shook this up as you can hear it. I gotta make sure that this thing is open, and this bad boy. It's gonna go right here. And this thing just fell on the ground. This is like probably like a spacer. I don't even know what you wanna call it. That went right here. I just had to take that out. But real quick guys, let me mount this pressure switch and let's get this show on the road. I'll see you in a little bit. All right guys, I got my induce motor on. Got my new pressure switch in and I got the baffle around my gas valve screwed in. And guys, there's nothing to it. Just plug and play. Once again, this is the OEM inducer. So the new one fit right in the place of the old one. We didn't have to do, we didn't have to make any modifications or do anything crazy. But now I just got to put the bottom cover on, wire this inducer motor in, and I'm going to give it a shot. I'll see you in a little bit. All right, guys, I got everything hooked in. Got all the screws back in place. Got the inducer wired in. And I didn't mention this, but this is a negative pressure switch. So with negative pressure switches, you want to use common and normally open. And with 90% furnaces, you guys will see it's a lot more common with 90 percenters. You may have a positive pressure switch that hooks up to the positive and that will go sometimes to the um, to the burner assembly box. The next time I'll see one of those, I'll definitely go over that. But 90% of pressure switches are going to be hooked to the negative port and you're going to use common to normally open. So on the call for heat, inducer runs, puts furnace in, in a negative pressure, it closes. Remember, it's normally open and that switch closes on a negative pressure 
once the inducer motor runs, assuming that the inducer motor is working correctly. And then from that point, the sequence becomes a sequence. But enough yapping. Let's turn this bad boy on. I may have to go back to that thermostat. Oh. Alright. I got the thermostat calling now. And I got the doors on. Let's get busy. Point four. Copacetic. I just heard my pressure switch close. There we go. Boom shagalaga. And now we wait for our fan to turn on. And I got my thermometer already up there in the vents. Well, in the plenum. And yeah. This was a pretty easy service call. So yeah, guys, just to recap once again. This is a no heat call. I knew that my thermostat was calling. And for two, I knew that this inducer was getting power because I traced it back from the circuit board. I think there's like a BLM heat tap and that BLM heat is the inducer. But yeah, guys, once I knew I had 115, I just ordered a new inducer motor. And once again, we don't do inducers without pressure switches. You can replace a pressure switch without the inducer. Once again, only if the inducer motor is pulling enough inches of water column. But for the most part, guys, once again, there's nothing wrong with replacing pressure switches with inducers because once again, these pressure switches are considered maintenance items. That diaphragm could stick when it gets real cold outside. So, and I can tell that that old that pressure switch was the OEM for the system. So, once again, guys. Just to cover my toe, we just got the new motor, new pressure switch in, and my fan just turned on. Okay, that's looking pretty good, 135. So now, let me just put this door on, and I'm going to rock out. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.